Very good. All I'm right, then. Um, hello, everyone. A, a very warm welcome to you, and particularly our speakers, John and Kay. Um, welcome to India. And very nice to have you on. I just wanted to say a few words. Um, this is a lecture which is part of our lecture series and um, Great Minds and Character Houses at the Centre for Historic Houses of India. I'm not able to go to the slide. Sorry, how do I do this? Uh, what what do we do? Just, just click on the presentation. You can delete the menu. Just now, you say anything. Yeah. No, it's working. All right. Um, just um, a few words about the Center for Historic Houses, which I established in 2019 at Virginia Google University. Um, it is meanwhile a national expert heritage body, part of the um, Department of Culture um, um, of the um, Indian government, and um, has been recognized as such. And um, we are also part of um, INTO, which is the International National Trust Organization, part of the National Trust in London which is really one of the oldest and largest heritage organizations in Europe. We have three main stakeholders, which you can see here, namely owners of historic houses, heritage experts and related industries, and the general public and the government. This is the first institution of its kind to be some sort of a developed organization for the property of historic houses in India. So what we do is heritage education action as a university research center, we do research relating to historic buildings and anything from art history to design history, heritage studies, and management. Some of the areas of um, special interest of the field is water and heritage and addressing some of the very big questions of our minds, and particularly the historic interior, which is a new research project we are starting now um, in May. Um, and so far, we haven't had a single comprehensive study of this topic, surprisingly. Um, instead, the focus has been the architecture. We establish a network for the family and historic houses of India. We create management plans, culture and educational events for historic houses, and uh, we are very active in outreach, knowledge transfer through digital heritage. We work briefly, nationally, and internationally, fostering global dialogue and heritage. Our focus is primarily on secular architecture and buildings um, that are used as homes. But so this lecture series today is part of um, the two lecture series that we do. One is Resilience, Historic Houses of India and their Custodians, which is primarily focused on India through the lens of the owners who tell the story of their own family and property and the kind of work that they do to keep these buildings in line. I mean, this has been a really successful series. We've done about 27 lectures that have been viewed by over 20,000 people so far. The other lecture series and is this one today, which is more of a global dialogue and heritage connecting people from around the world with people in India. So we've had a number of institutions that, um, um, that we presented here and um, that you can see on the right, such as the Getty Foundation, the various palaces, palace museums in India, the Courtauld Institute, Rick Foundation, and so many others. When we first started out, um, I was really happy that the um, Financial Times mentioned um, our centre and what we were doing. And they particularly mentioned um, that um, heritage um, offers hope for tourism. But of course, we want to have a much, much broader view of the benefits of the historic houses. So we have a collaboration with a number of historic houses, and um, we do um, various kinds of um, collaborations. One of the families we are working with is the Earth by World family of Porta. And just to give you an impression here, there are a diverse number of historic buildings associated with the family, ranging from an early 20th century palace that you see here, Omid Baban, um, to a um, British residency from the um, uh, early 19th century and um, a much older um, 17th century fort that you see there. And uh, this particular property, the fort, is known for a fantastic um, uh, collection of um, art and miniature paintings, um, which I showed here. Um, but this is something we wouldn't know associate quarter, you associate quarter with the kind of coaching um, centers and so on. And we are looking at the various kind of opportunities affiliated with these buildings and uses and functions, from ranging from hotels to museums 
wedding venues and, and much just to give you an idea. So we would like to ask how restored buildings benefit communities and the local communities and other visitors. And we would like to demonstrate that historic um, buildings generate a large number of services and job opportunities. And we would like to study this in a much more systematic way and how they are valued by the local stakeholders. And we see, we would like to understand historic buildings as assets. And this is also why we invited today um, our two panelists to talk about the kind of objective and, and economic approach to measure value and help find an ideal management principles for these historic buildings. Unfortunately, in many non-Western countries, heritage is regarded as an obstacle to development. This is why I'm so keen to focus on, um, on the economic approach for historic buildings. So we, we propose to regard these assets, and that's why I invited Adal and Lisa and Tom and Saga today to give a presentation on tools for the assessment and management of historic buildings and culture more generally. So our first speaker is Harman Saga, who's the head economist um, at um, the uh, Department for Culture. It's a very long word, and gets stuck all the time. Digital, uh, culture, media, and sports. And Adal and Lisa, who's the head economist um, um, at Historic England. So this is our program for today, and uh, we will be sharing this in the chat um, to, um, so that you can actually follow where we are. We we'll start with an introduction to the culture and heritage capital approach by Harman Saga, followed by um, an in-depth kind of culture and heritage capital framework. Then we have a, an explanation of the social cost benefit analysis, and then finally, some practical examples and, and, and research from historic England that Adana Lisi will be presenting. And if there's time, we would love to have a discussion and hear your response to what we are proposing here. So thank you very much and a very, very warm welcome to Adana and, uh, and uh, Harry. So I'll just stop sharing and I'll give it over to uh, Harman Saga. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, uh, everyone. It's really great to be here. So thanks for reminding me. I just wanted to quickly check, Mimi, um, how long, when should we, me and Adala, stop presenting? What time would you like us to hand over for questions? Um, so I would propose that we stop. Um, we, you have an hour from now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much. And it's an absolute uh, pleasure. Uh, to be here and, and talk to everyone who's uh, in the room and then uh, online as well. Um, yeah, so obviously it's also quite a privilege. Uh, my, my background is actually Indian, uh, family from Punjab originally, so it's, uh, I feel like I'm uh, seeing, uh, <laughs> seeing India again. So um, yeah, so I'm going to put my slides up um, and uh, the way we're going to do this is I'm going to present first and uh, as I mentioned, uh, Dala will follow my presentation. Hopefully, I'll kind of give everybody the um, the kind of starting point. So, hopefully, can I? Hopefully, the slides are up on the screen at the moment. Um, please tell me. Uh, hopefully, that should be fine. So, um, as I said, um, Adala uh, will present after me. Um, and I am the head economist for arts and tourism here in the Department of Culture, Media and Sports in the UK government. Um, I'm actually, uh, funny enough, uh, currently uh, in a side kind of job, um, also as the deputy director for analysis that covers creative industry, sports, gambling, tourism and civil society, which is the kind of, um, kind of more social side of the department as well. So, um, but today I'm going to focus on cultural capital. So, just in terms of what I'm going to go through in, in my session, um, I've kind of extended this slightly uh, from the original uh, brief uh, this morning, but effectively it's, it's covering the same areas that we just mentioned. So I'm going to give you a background on uh, DCMS and the kind of UK government and what we think about the impact of the heritage sector. Uh, then a quick introduction to the programme itself. This is a huge programme that we're uh, delivering and I'm going to say a bit more about the nuts and the bolts of that. Um, and then finally, uh, that's not finally, but the next part, then I'll go through the framework, very high level framework. I'll then do a practical ap application, uh, but a very hypothetical practical application. It's, it won't be a real world example. And then finally, I want to add in uh, another part of this, which is the link between uh, the work that we're doing and the role of heritage science. And then obviously I'll pass on to Adala to talk more 
from her side of uh, her practical examples and uh, areas that she's looking at in historic England. So if we move to the first uh, part one, this is the background to DCMS and the her her and heritage and the UK government impacts framework. So just very quickly, this is um, Department of Culture and Community Sports. We used to have digital in it, but we've very recently taken digital out. That's moved to a new department uh, called Department uh, for Science uh, and um, uh, and, and technology, so D set. Um, so at the moment, we are culture, which includes heritage, um, uh, arts, media, sports, tourism, and civil society. Civil society is where a lot of charities are. People are doing things like loneliness, helping youth programs. It's a very interesting area. Um, and so that's kind of where we are as a department at the moment, and we're kind of go currently going for a structural change at the moment, given we've uh, the things that have moved out are digital, uh, data, cyber. Um, AI has moved out as well, but we are keeping very close to them as well, given the links to our sectors. So overall, um, the Department of Culture and Sports uh, is kind of worth around 162 billion in uh, gross value added to the to the UK economy. Um, that's about 8.5 percent of uh, effective uh, gross value added, which is similar to GDP. But I won't go through the differences now. Uh, but think of it like that. Um, the chart on the uh, on the on the right of your screen there uh, shows how that breaks to how that 160 billion breaks down across our sectors. So it's about just over 100 billion for the creative industries. Um, a subset of the creative industries which are in there are the are, are the cultural sectors, which include some of the art sectors, theatres, museums. They are also in the creative industries, but they're broken out here just to show their specific impact. We then have tourism civil society, sports, and then gambling as well. The interesting thing here is um, in our cultural definition or creative industries definition, we don't actually uh, have a broad definition of heritage here, which I'll come back to on the next slide. At the moment, it only really uh, picks up the impact of the visitor attractions and the historic sites. Now, this is a gross value added method. So it's very much about the sector's value added uh, not the kind of uh, retail, the big retail impact. So these are probably smaller than you may see in other types of, of methods, but that's kind of how we look at that in, in the UK. Uh, really important point, um, particularly around the creative industries as well, they really outstrip the rest of the sectors in, in the UK. They're one of the fastest growing sectors, and I'm sure uh, it's very similar in India as well, actually, where the film sector, the TV sector, video games is kind of just really growing as popularity increases, and especially for video games as they've become more mainstream in the last few years. Um, so that's kind of where we are in terms of the economic impact. Um, as I mentioned, um, the definition we have there is a very, very, uh, very specific definition of um, heritage. And the work that sorry England have done and Adala, specifically, who we'll be talking later, is they've kind of widened that kind of definition up. And so when they look at the direct kind of gross value added impact on the economy, so the impact, the contribution of heritage to the economy, uh, they've they they talk about libraries and archives. Um, and other areas, but the really interesting one that we isn't in our numbers. Some of the other ones aren't as well, but this is a really one that's definitely missing. Is that um, about just under half of that uh, contribution to the economy is actually coming from the construction sector, and that's where you'll have very specific skills and very specific inputs into uh, the sector where people have special skills to kind of rebuild um, and look after historic sites um, and also construction. So it's a really big area that we don't currently capture in our main numbers and some work we're going to be taking forward with Adala um, and other organizations to see if we can bring this wider definition into our wider definition of the impact of our sectors. But uh, so far, very kind of economic based measures. Um, the other thing that we do is we actually capture a national survey um, about on and this this is just for England. Um, so I should have mentioned actually in the UK uh, culture is what we call devolved. So in England we look at culture ourselves, but in Scotland and Wales they'll have their own uh, way of doing it and own funding. So it's slightly different. So our survey only recovers England in this case uh, for culture. And again, what we look at that is different attendance measures. And I should say this was over October to December 22. Obviously, previously, the numbers were lower because of COVID. Uh, but these things are starting to hopefully move in the right direction. So uh, what's interesting is arts, in this case, is a very wide definition of arts. So 74% of uh, people at least go, um, attend at least one arts 
um, uh, event or um, uh, asset a year, uh, but that also includes cinemas, by the way. So it's quite a wide definition. Uh, public library is around 20%. That's actually lower than it normally is. And I think some of that's to do with COVID still. Um, heritage sites, uh, very popular actually during COVID, very popular because a lot of these were out, especially the ones that are outside. Uh, they tend to be places where people would go. Um, and then museum galleries, again, quite high. We expect that to hopefully increase uh, as people get readjusted back to post COVID. The other really important thing that we've been picking up recently is all the information on digital engagement as well. So obviously, especially during COVID, there was a big kind of switch to these areas. And then we're trying to, trying to look at how we measure these in a better way. Um, those are small, but hopefully we'll be growing. Um, obviously, what we're trying to do in there, we're not picking up people just clicking on sites. Is that actually engagement, not just going to site and finding out where your museum is? So that's another way. So then, in case we are now measuring, we have for many, many years been measuring like how do we engage in culture. But the problem is, we're not really measuring the full impact there. If we're only in looking at the kind of economic impact, we're not looking at the full impact of that culture going to have on society. So we really need to start picking that up and this is what the cultural Treasures capital program is looking to do so uh just as a kind of a background um the cultural heritage capital team is, is run from the department of culture media and sports um i can lead a bigger team of about 10 analysts but we have a specific sub team uh which is led by matt benzano uh and he works with jordan um and they kind of are effectively uh, the kind of front piece secretariat of the cultural program, but we've been very keen in ensuring that we work with our funded bodies. And we have these bodies that we fund called arms length bodies that are funded by us, uh, but they also have analysts um, and we work very close to them. So Story England is one of our kind of key bodies and that um, Adala, who will be talking later, leads a team on that working on CHC. We have the Arts Council, uh, there's um, uh, the Director of Research, Andrew Moeller, has been working with us on the Cultural Treasure Capital Programme, so I'm going to call CHC from now on. And also BFI, so, so I should mention, uh, Arts Council covers all the arts sector, theatres, mu um, smaller museums, and the arts, obviously, Historic England captures the heritage side. Um, Adala will probably say a bit more about that in her presentation. And then BFI is our film institute, and they cover film funding, actually uh, TV, and actually more recently looking at games as well. And we are working with them, and we're doing a specific study, or they are at the moment, which is looking at the local value of uh, film, um, sorry, cinema, sorry, which is quite important. So that's what we work with. And then there's, I haven't got in the slide, but there's a whole plethora of other organizations in the UK and actually internationally of UNESCO, uh, OECD, who are very interested in the work we're doing. So that's kind of the team. Um, but the question is, why do we need a, what we're calling a heritage capital approach, a cultural heritage capital approach? So currently um, in the UK perspective, we don't have a consistent approach to valuing culture and heritage and the impact it has on society. And the way that we do that in central government in, in the UK, in, in England and the UK is we, we do that through what we call social cost benefit analysis. So um, it used to just be called cost benefit analysis, uh, which confused people because they thought, because we're economists, we only deal with economic you know, GVA, jobs, GDP. But social cost benefit analysis is, is, is basically trying to say, actually, you've got to actually capture all the benefits, whether it's a uh, health benefit or whether it's kind of someone's enjoyment or um, uh, understanding of, of, of going to a, a cultural asset and, and across the piece. So we tend to use that term social cost analysis because we're interested in the holistic overarching approach of it. And it's a very specific technique, which I'll go on into a second and what, where that comes from. So, but the point is that because we don't have that consistent approach, people are either doing different things, but it also means in some cases we're not value anything. And that means we're undervaluing um, our sector, which is a problem, especially when it comes to funding. And, and other people have got this, these techniques for their sectors, whether it's transport, health, and they can show that kind of impact. Um, and when I, when I say impacts on this, I'll come back to this, but when we talk about uh, value, we basically mean putting all the benefits in pounds and pence. Uh, so in, in, in other words, in dollars or in euros. So when you have an economic impact, which says, as I said before, 107 billion, um, you also can say, well, the social value is worth X billion pounds as well. And that's what we're trying to get to. So, um, and as I said, there's an increasing ask uh, for us, for us in DCMS to basically lead on this and provide some guidance. And I'll, t and I'll explain why uh, that is the case in a second. Um, 
So what's our aim? We, we want to develop a formal approach to looking at the costs and benefits of cultural heritage and the impacts on society. This is very much built within the idea of um, our finance ministry, which is called HMT, HM Treasury. Uh, they're, they're two guides, which if you're interested in um, looking at uh, this more broadly, um, it's called the Green Book and the Magenta Book. And I'll say a bit about that, a bit more of that in a second. But these are effectively our guides to how you look at impact and how you evaluate programs. Um, and the other thing we want to do is we want to create a whole wide set of statistics and guidance, as I said, um, which will help articulate the values. So this could be where you have values for health or values for visiting a museum and or visiting a heritage site. So that's kind of our, our goal with this. And that's, that's very similar to what other departments in the UK have got in terms of Department for Health or Transport or the Environment. So, um, as I said, this is um, our kind of... Um, um, uh, this is the green book, effectively, and um, what this resets out for economists and other analysts is how you do that social cost benefit analysis. It's going to set the rules of the game, if you like, for like, if you're going to look at impact, you should follow this thinking way of doing it. And the green back is what we call a welfare approach. And welfare approach means effectively you're looking at the impact on society the welfare impact on society or society so you're trying to see how does this affect the average person in uh, in society in terms of how they how they benefit from this which is very important especially from our side when you're dealing with public funding because you need to show the value of that public funding back to the people the big aim of obviously the green book because it's an economic approach is they want you to put a value on these benefits and that means you you can compare costs and you can provide benefits on the same basis so if costs are in in our case pounds or in euros we can then uh, or dollars we can then compare the benefits in pounds and euros so then we can see which ones are offering what we call higher value for money um so this again as i said is, is kind of the the thing that covers all the monitoring and evaluation sector um and then the second uh, document again if you're interested in evaluation this is a fantastic guide to how you undertake evaluation for any project and program. Um, it sets out how you scope, design, manage, and disseminate, and all the capabilities you need as evaluator. Again, these two publications are a fantastic resource for anyone, any analyst who wants to kind of understand how you do analysts within a public sector environment. And actually, not, not just for that, also more generally within um, any kind of environment, actually, if you're being asked to do this type of work. So, um, really really important actually point i just wanted to highlight um as i said we take a welfare approach and the welfare approach as i said is very much about what is the benefit to the public and unlike kind of i think people often think economists are only interested in gdp and job creation uh that's not true in terms of how we look at it into especially how the green book looks at it so we're very much interested in the cultural social and economic impacts one of the big difficulties things is you have to start defining what those social and cultural impacts are as well so not just for the public sector we are talking to a number of public sector private private sector people who want to be able to show their impact on society and that's also important because some of these people will be also be showing their impact and maybe for example trying to get additional funding or a into private giving um really important point here is that this isn't just for the cultural heritage sector um i'm sure it's the case that many of you that, that you work in actually there'll be things that affect culture and heritage especially monuments and and heritage sites where you might have a big transport scheme in many cases that transport scheme will look at the impact of creating the new road that road will have great impacts on productivity and growth because people can travel to their jobs and create businesses but obviously, if you have to destroy or move or harm an ass, uh, one of our cultural assets, we need to be able to show what that impact is so it's taken into account. It may not stop the program, but it allows us to think about how you mitigate those impacts. And it's a very similar thing in the environment when you're looking at a potential impact on, e uh, on a kind of area or set of trees or ecosystem. So um, it's really, really important that the way that we do this is that this uh, helps help make decisions, the work that we're doing and how social cost benefit, benefit works. But the point is, it's not in isolation. You must also look at other evidence, whether it's expert opinion, case studies, qualitative information, even narrative approaches. So it's part of the uh, toolkit. It's not the only thing that you use to make decisions. 
really final we put on the slide is it's multidisciplinary. We will not be doing this just with economists. This will also include um, heritage scientists, heritage experts, also arts and humanities experts as well. Um, and uh, someone who I uh, previously worked in the environment sector, um, I spent a lot of my time as an economist, um, environmental economist working with heritage with the climate scientists to work out carbon effects and carbon values. So it's very similar kind of thought process we're taking here. Um, so our main outputs, because uh, what we want to deliver, one is a, a big bank of values to help you value the as different assets. Um, supplementary guidance to what I mentioned was the green book. Now, the green book has lots of supplementary guidance. That, again, if you're interested in health or other sectors, environment they have supplementary guidance specific for sectors that's that's made for those sectors because they have specific specific needs and that is kind of where we want to go down in the future as well and then finally something which is going to take a bit more time is a national accounts for cultural and heritage so at the moment we will have the national accounts in most countries for measuring the economic value of our sectors but what we don't have is a, is a, how we measure that the non-economic uh, investment sectors and this is something used in the environment sector which is the natural capital accounting um, and something we kind of want to take forward as well and, and see how we can make sure cultural and heritage has its own way of looking at its full value on society. And this, as some of you may know, this is kind of the work uh, which is called kind of Beyond GDP and people like to, to Sculpture and others are, are working on this work. work. So um, we are, I'm not going to go through this, but we have a big governance board with um, chaired by uh, Lord Mendoza in, in department, uh, Lord Mendoza. He is also uh, the person who wrote the Mendoza Review uh, about six, seven years ago, which talked about how we can um, improve and make better the museums um, we have a range of people there some of you who, who know this area already may recognize David Throsby he is a person who originally came up with the kind of concept of cultural capital um, obviously not just him but he was the big instigator and we've been working very close with him fantastic economist um, definitely someone worth talking to um, and they they will provide strategic and technical direction so um, the framework um, I'm going to talk a bit about that because I've, talking, I've talked about it very much in the abstract at the moment. So just to kind of step back. So in 2021, we actually launched the Cultural Capital Programme. As I said, that was very much built on the basis of the natural capital approach, uh, which is being used by many organisations around the world and big part of our department for the environment's 25-year uh, plan. Um, and so we took that and we thought, okay, this is a really good basis to think about this and can we apply this to uh, the cultural and heritage sectors as well. As I said, consistent with the Green Book, this is the kind of thing that all the chief economists in, in government use. And we've also set up the advisory group, uh, which is kind of two levels of advisory group. We also have a steering group with a lot of organizations as well to get that, that feed in. And then uh, finally, in 21, we published uh, a big document, which I'll show on the next page, uh, but we released the framework document. And also we've got a website now um, and that's got uh, various guidance and research on it from sorry, England, the Arts Council and the British Film Institute. So this was our um, this is our kind of approach at the moment. Um, so what we set out in the document is we, we were trying to go for kind of four areas, creating values, uh, monetizable values um, that we can use for different outcomes. Uh, and assets uh, and developing those. One is engagement. This is engagement. This is a big thing we're doing is trying to talk to people and get them, get them on side because we can't do this by ourselves. Uh, and we want to we have, we have a lot of input because this is not a one, two year program. We want to take this long term. Uh, third area is methods. We need to build new methods. Um, one of those which I'll talk about a bit later. And then also the guidance at the end. Um, and so this was the publication we published. If you haven't seen this, it's probably worth a quick read. This kind of sets out our ambition for the program um, and what we want to achieve. In that document, we published a framework. Now, um, sorry, this might be a little bit fuzzy. Um, this effectively is the cultural framework in a very, very high level. We haven't gone deeper than this at the moment, but we will be going deeper than this. But basically what it sets out is that we have a set of cultural and heritage assets uh, stocks. These produce goods and services, which then lead to benefits or flows from those services. And that kind of feedbacks and increasing the kind of total asset life of those stocks over time and obviously the wealth of the nation. And then what happens is those stocks and flows are affected by interventions and other pressures. One of those pressures could be climate change all the way to um, impacts on um, doing a new program, such as, for example, you might have a program that's looking at men maintaining certain assets. So that's it in a, in a nutshell. It's kind of a systems approach and put it, put it, in, and put it into some order. That, what that 
kind of means another way. Another way of thinking, another example of thinking of that is that if we think about a museum, that will have a number of features. This is just an example where this is not a definitive list. It'll have a number of features in that museum they produce a number of services so they might have conservation services education services audience services those services then lead to specific benefits whether it's health and well-being research and development and then they lead to bringing it together a total value of the organization or, or the area so that's in a nutshell this probably sounds very obvious to people but at the moment there isn't actually a way of structuring this at the moment there are many ways but there's no real way of doing it so we're trying to create some kind of order to the to, to the kind of the way that we think about how benefits are created so that's it in a nutshell um now to do that though and i'm not going to dwell too long on this slide uh, to do that though to once you've worked out that by delivering something it creates an outcome that outcome as i said could be um, a health benefit or it may be a more of a cultural benefit in terms of um, uh, feeling pri pride in uh, going to the museum or enjoying the museum or learning uh, we need a way of measuring that and the way the general ways that are used within the economic field are things uh, that I think this is a contingent valuation choice building that in itself would need an entire lecture to go through those but the one that we're using more readily is a thing called contingent valuation where we actually literally ask people how much they value it um, and I'll, and that's like we say, well, how much you value going to this museum, which could be free. We ascertain that value. We average it across a big sample survey. And then we kind of come up with an average value for people going to that museum or that asset. Um, so this is what's coming up. We've got um, some uh, publications coming up soon on digital collections. Uh, so valuing digital collections and digital museums, uh, valuing local museums, um, a paper we're doing linking economics and heritage science. We've got a huge 3.1 billion million, sorry, not billion million pound research call, which I'll talk about in the next slide. We're then developing the framework into a lot more detail. So we're really going to define those services and benefits. And that's something we're doing over the next few months. And also we have a research for the next few years where we're going to try and do some work on health, health benefits and, and well-being and, and learning impacts. Um, so just very quickly, we have a 3.1 million pound um, research call at the moment. Uh, the kind of calls kind of ended in terms of applications. Now we're assessing the bids, and that's going to pick up things such as uh, how natural capital and cultural capital link together, all the way to how we value digital assets. And an area which we think is really interesting is how do you value what we call non-use value, which is actually the fact that people value a lot of these heritage assets, even though they never see them. Um, it forms part of their kind of culture or their belonging or their identity um, and also they value that other people can see it as well in the future so that's a very interesting area that we're looking at um, very unique not totally unique we have this in the environment sector but very it can be a very unique area for, for the cultural sector and those projects will start hopefully in september and be going over the next couple of years so um i want to just quickly touch on one final area before handing over to adala and so um, that's the program in a nutshell and we've got lots of research going on which i can talk about in the in the q a um but that's just an introduction uh one of the really interesting areas which i think this group might be interested in is the thing i mentioned earlier which is how you basically bring multidisciplinary uh, approaches together and one of those um actually is um like how do you then do the social cost benefit analysis right so that's 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 number one uh, so let me go through this first which then i'm going to talk about heritage science the next bit so um so i just mi mix my slides up slightly so um in terms of social cost benefit analysis i actually want to show you what that actually means practically and how we use these values so a typical case study will be for us is a museum is trying to construct a new museum it or it might be recreating a new gallery or conserving it or creating new storage facilities or in some cases extending the gallery or refitting it um, or changing back office space and usually there's a, a thing that's a thing that's changing which we need to then value the impact on that on the public so um what often happens and you'll see this in a lot of uh, pieces of work is um what we need to do is basically create a cost benefit ratio that is you know costs over benefits so uh, for every one pound of cost you're getting x number of benefits so in this example here we're saying for every one pound of cost you're going and you're getting 0.8 uh, back in benefits which obviously isn't great because you want to be above one and that obviously leads to a negative net impact so net present value i'm not going to go into a lot of detail but that effectively is your net value of all the benefits over uh, time it could be 30 years 20 years 
At the moment, um, if you just focus on the economic impact, remember this is very fictitious, by the way, so these numbers could be higher or lower. You might only be measuring tourism impacts and productivity impacts, but the problem is that's not the full value of, say, the museum or the heritage site. So what we're trying to say is, well, you need to add the other benefits into this analysis, into this cost-benefit analysis. Um, now, those other benefits could be a number of different benefits. So it could be the use value. So that's the value you get from a private individual going and actually engaging or a non-use value, which is, as I said, people uh, engaging, uh, valuing something whenever going to it. Health benefits, because there are lots of cases now where you actually can measure the health impact of engagement. <clears throat> and also in some cases where there are specific education programs, the education impact or the learning impact also in, and uh, there's definitely in the uk a lot of our heritage assets and museums are actually volunteer led as well and that also has a benefit and then finally there will be r d benefits because a lot of organizations actually use these assets to create r d so just on the use value this is a really interesting area for us because we often value well, how much do you value for going to the museum or visiting heritage sites but we haven't really broken down why they're valuing it and that's kind of our next piece of research so those values could be you know, aesthetic value an entertainment value an emotional value a spiritual value uh, belonging and pride um and then as i said the other other areas are non-use value where you might just value its existence without wanting to go to it you might value that other people can um enjoy it or you might value that future generations can enjoy it as well. Um, and those are two areas we're going to work on. The non-use value is a specific one we're going to we'll look at because it's not it's, it's not well defined when you start trying to implement it in cost benefit analysis. So a uh, good example of this is museums. In a, in a couple of uh, studies, we've asked like the hypothetical, you know, um, what would you willing to pay um, if the museum wasn't free or visit the museum or keeping it open? And on the non-use side, again, same kind of question, what would you be willing, willing to pay if um, to stop the museum closing or not being accessible to other people. Um, those kind of ascertain a value. And in a few case studies, these are the ones we've done. So for museums, uh, for the use value, for example, for the World Museum, it's about six pounds. And these will vary because they're different sizes, they do different things. And that's allowed us to come up with an average value, which we can use in other museums. And then we have a non-use value. So those seven, six pounds, uh, six pound here for the World Museum is the annual uh value uh so the, the vis per visit value of going to the museum and um, this is for pe museums that aren't charging or charging a ticket price and then the non-use value is the kind of annual value um, a certain population uh wants to keep that museum open how much they be how much they, they value that now this is equivalent value by the way so there's not really a economic value in the sense that it can be exchanged for a monetary value uh, a, a kind of a market value what we're saying is saying here is that if you give someone in this case six pounds one p um or you take them to the world museum they will be no better or worse off which allows us to equivalize the value that they gain from going to these museums so we can talk about the value of going to a museum now in kind of pounds and pence terms so yeah probably a not if you're not seen this for probably a slightly difficult concept to kind of get to, to, to kind of absorb uh but this is a very common method used and i'm happy to talk about this in a bit more detail if it's if it's not totally clear um and then what we do here's an example here where if the museum has 700,000 visitors a year uh in this case we can use the use value of 6.86 pounds which is one of the examples on the previous page and that leads to 4.8 million in use value a year um, and a non-use value, we work out a catchment area of who the non-users are. So for some of our big museums, our national museums, that could well be the whole country. Um, whereas a regional museum, it may be more of a regional uh, catchment area. So if it's a million pounds, times it by £3.30, we get £3.6 million. As you can see, that's still quite a big number, even against the people who visit. Anyway, so what you can do is add that up. You get £8.4 million a year. Uh, and that's just coming from the use and non-use values. And that goes into the social cost benefit analysis. So you end up adding these things into your social cost benefit analysis. You add in your use values. Hopefully you can uh, value education, health and volunteering benefits. This is, should say these these are fictitional, fic fictitious. You don't, this, isn't, this isn't actually a real world, world example, just for illustration. And then you can suddenly show actually your cost benefit ratio is much higher and actually, this has a lot bigger impact on society. Um, the important point, think, point is, is this is not just to do in isolation. In reality, what you're supposed to be doing is looking at, at different options. So you may have different options for, for example, uh, building a different museum or gallery. And this allows you to, with your decision process, understand which one offers better 
benefit to cost ratio or what we call value for money. That's how social cost benefit analysis works, basically. And CHC, unfortunately, at the moment, or the state of the evidence world, we can't always fill in that benefit section. And that's where CHC is trying to fill in. So that's very quickly. I think um, I'm going to quickly go through the next slide. So Dala's got enough time to speak. So Dala, I'm probably going to be another two or three minutes and I'll hand over to you. So very, very finally, this is a kind of an extra bit I thought I'd add into the presentation, which wasn't in there. We will be publishing a paper very soon. And this hopefully shows, as I was saying earlier, too early, this shows how we bring disciplines together. So heritage scientists and management experts and also economists. So what's really, what's really important here is a lot of the assets we, we deal with um, um, need to be able to value their kind of impact. Um, and what, what we're dealing with a lot in the UK at the moment is how you value uh, interventions with, which are around protecting, conserving, repairing, and maintaining uh, our, our assets. And so what we thought was, could we bring these two disciplines of eco economists and heritage science together to come up with a, a new way of thinking about this? Not new way, but a, kind of a revitalize an idea that, had, was, that happened many years ago. So what we want to understand is if you don't do those things, if you let your assets degrade or get lost, what is the impact of not doing that repair and maintenance? And what does that mean for social cost benefit analysis? And the kind of reason for that is, and then why it's important is that a lot of the, if you don't do that work, a lot of the benefits um, or the cost of society in this case um, are irreversible. You lose the heritage asset, you can't create a new heritage asset, so they're unique. And so we need to be able to show that by maintaining and doing that and keeping that, we can keep the value for future generations. Um, so that's why we think heritage science will play a really important role for understanding the condition of the assets but also how hypothetically, if you don't do those interventions, how they would degrade over time. So you can imagine in most cases, you'll have assets which will degrade naturally, uh, if not kept in the right state. So the right kind of climate control conditions, if they're in the museum, they'll degrade at a certain rate, which we kind of can call damage, what we call damage functions. Um, and then we can arrest or change that rate if we intervene to stop it through conservation and protection or other and maintenance of buildings. So that's the thing we're looking at. Um, and this is a big program we're running at the moment on this. So you're not about to read this, we can send this around the slides. Um, this is actually a piece of work that we work with the Story England on, which is what we call a theory of change. And this is our theory of change for maintenance at museums. And what we're looking at is what the types of things of intervening are, for example, fixing the roofs, uh, upgrading them building, upgrading heat and wiring systems, uh, lighting systems, security systems, and then what that stops. So um, you can't see here, but one of the outcomes is stopping material failure and degradation to the museum buildings collections. Also stopping catastrophic losses, such as a flood or a fire. And then that will lead on to, uh, if you don't stop those things happening, obviously that will lose you visitor value, use value, health benefits. So that's the other end of this theory of changes, like how do we capture those benefits? So that's why we think for the Pacific thing, I'm looking at um, failure or degradation of collections and buildings, we can bring in the heritage science concepts, which already look at those losses and have value statements on that. So that's why that's what I say is that what we can create here using heritage science is a kind of a hypothetical uh, thing. If you avoid if you avoid that loss, and that loss can be defined through the heritage science, i.e., what we call as I said, what we call damage functions, so the loss over time of of an object. Uh, we can then link that to the values we've got, and at the moment, assume it's a linear connection. So if you lose uh, one object, you lose. And, and it's 100 objects, you lose 1% of the value we've created. Now, it's not as simple as that, obviously, uh, but that's kind of the area we want to work on at the moment. And I'm publishing a paper, hopefully very soon, with a, bit, a lot more detail on what I'm presenting here and how, how that can be done. And the way that can be done, though, is a concept we've landed on is what we call damage functions. So those on the call who come from the sector will know this concept, hopefully. Um, there are not many of these around, and we have to develop these at the moment. And at the moment, we'll focus on how we create damage functions for our museum maintenance uh, funding at the moment. And as I said, this will be a counterfactual uh, argument based within science. So the idea is that if you can say, if you do not do this thing, we know scientifically all happened to the object of the building, we can then demonstrate the loss to society of not intervening. Um, yeah, so um, as I said, we, we will probably be doing further research in this area. Um, we think it's a very 
interesting area that we could take forward. It's very much in its theoretical stage at the moment. Uh, there are a few who have tried it before, but so we're now going to put some investment into kind of seeing how, how we can take this concept forward and linking economist heritage science, which I think is quite exciting. Um, as I said, the whole program needs to be led by multi personally multidisciplinary. And we think this is one example of one area where we, where we can do that. So um, one final thing, um, it's not just about obviously that we are still looking at probability functions. So uh, a great example of this is if you've got the chance of uh, fixing the fire suppression systems, you can look at the probability of a fire occurring if you don't fix them. And then what we basically do is we look at the probability over time, look at the values and say, well, if, if that probability increases over time, there's a higher probability of losing that value. Um, so what, that's kind of what we call uh, real options analysis, and this could be added to the heritage science work um, to understand if you uh, don't do something, I fix your fire system, um, as we saw in a couple of examples around the world. Uh, if that gets, if the risk gets higher and higher and higher, at some point it should just be intervened because the loss is going to be pretty big. Uh, but hopefully that'll give you a signal of when, how long you should be able to put it off for. But um, obviously, when you've just put one in, the, the probability of loss should be quite low. But even if you do a new system over over years, that, that loss will get higher as it gets older. Um, so that's a really a nutshell on some work we're doing now. It's very much a bit more detail, a bit more of a deep dive. Um, so just uh, finally, as I said, we um, I'm going to skip this slide, but just very finally, um, this is a huge program. We are thinking about this uh, not just over a two-year cycle. We've got funding. We're thinking about a long-term cycle. So I'm now going to hand over to Adala, uh, who's going to go through her slides um, and go through her more kind of specific examples. So hopefully, Adala, I can stop sharing. Can you see that? Uh, yeah, you just need to go into presentation mode. Is that right? Yeah, I can see that. Okay, great. I'm assuming everyone in the room can see that. Um, thank you so much for having me today. It's a real pleasure to be here and working across uh, national boundaries. Very exciting. Um, I'm going to try and keep it short and sweet because I realize we are running out of time. Um, but let me just introduce you to my team and the work we're doing at Historic England and just some of our early evaluation work and how we're really trying to think of how we integrate this approach that Harry's been talking about in detail into the work we, we already do. We already do. So um, it's, I am, I'm head of socioeconomic analysis and evaluation at Historic England. And I run a small team of analysts. Um, and really, our goal is to think of how we can create an evidence base. Um, and what we, we say is better evidence, um, better decision making for heritage. So that's really our key objective. Um, and in order to achieve this, we think we need to look at heritage quite broadly, which is, um, I guess, is quite unusual because I work with a lot of wonderful colleagues who know everything about very specific aspects of heritage um, and can talk for hours about different bits of this, this heritage. But we really want to see it from a much more holistic and strategic way. So my team consists of economists, um, we have uh, evaluation specialists, we have social um, scientists as well as environmental scientists. And we also have a data analyst that we're just hiring to. And so this team is supposed to kind of cover these key areas, economy, society and environment. And we think by taking this much rounded view, holistic view of heritage, that's how we can better make the case for heritage. So we believe strongly that heritage, the values of heritage are multiple. Um, we believe that we need to look at it in this holistic way to better capture, oops, sorry, to better capture the value. So often we talk about the archaeology, sort of a bridge to the past. 
Um, we also talk about the architectural value, the unique distinctiveness, aesthetic beauty, all these kinds of things that people really can very qualitatively talk about. But often in the field of work that we work in, we need these things to be evidenced and kind of uh, made explicit and often not always with numbers. So we really want to think of how can we incorporate this new way of thinking, this new way of applying economics to our evaluation. So our aims um, with our evaluation is to produce uh, evidence that demonstrates impact um, and shows change over time as a result of our intervention. And we do this um, often uh, driven by what we call a theory of change, Harry just went through it, or also a logic model, which the first thing we do when before we set out with evaluation is really understanding, you know, what is this project, what is this intervention type trying to do? If I'm giving you funding to fix a roof or whatever, or do some repair maintenance, what is it you're trying to do? To do? And just go through this really logical process that will help you as you go through your evaluation to kind of ground yourself and return to your understanding of why are we doing this thing. Um, and really, as Harry also mentioned, we are guided by uh, Treasury and their guidance they provide through Magenta Book and Green Book. Uh, why can't I touch it? It's like that. Um, we also always kind of support our analysis and work with a uh, detailed monitoring and evaluation framework. And this is just gives you an idea of what that would contain. We kind of um, provide a context, think of our logic model, look at evidence around our theory of change. So you tell me that by doing this intervention you're going to it's going to result in all these benefits where is the evidence and that's where in that theory of change we really pull together the evidence that exists already that tells us why we think these things will happen um, we also kind of look at what our evaluation objectives are and what our key evaluation questions are we look at um our data collection methods, think of how we will um, be able to evidence these things, and then think of what that approach, how we're going to quantify these things, how we're going to measure them and um, tell people about them. Um, and we also do a lot around collecting monitoring data. So this is just an example of one of our dashboards where we collect information. And in the, in the left-hand side there, you'll see the types of outputs we're measuring things like um installing artwork attendees to events um shop fronts reinstated so it depends on the intervention but we try and make sure that we're always collecting on a regular in this case quarterly basis um information about we've given you money what's being delivered or we are paying money what is being delivered so that's kind of where we are at the moment. And now we're really trying to take our analysis to a new level, which is really trying to bring in this uh, CHC approach. It's early days. I can't say we've we've nailed it quite yet, but we are thinking about it. Um, and I'm just going to give you some examples of how we think going forward we can start to do this within the framework that Harry presented, which is a stock flow of service and benefit model. Um, so culture and heritage capital is, you know, really looking at the stock. So for us, when we start an evaluation, what are the heritage assets that we're looking at here? And these could be tangible. They're obviously the more easier ones to see, but they could also be intangible. And that's um, more difficult for us as economists, but that's where we really need to work collaboratively with colleagues who really get this, who really understand when they talk about heritage, what that intangible intangibility is about um, and in general you could uh, quanti you could characterize these stocks as capital and um, we also look then for so what do these assets provide what are the flows of services that can generate unique benefits and I think I say can because it's not automatic just having a heritage asset doesn't mean um, it results in lots of benefits to people. So they're not automatic. Often it's linked to the condition of the asset as well, as you will know. Um, then we start to look at the benefits. You know, 
really trying to quantify through our monitoring in the case of evaluation, what are the benefits that people are deriving from these heritage assets and the interventions we're um, undertaking to improve either the condition or uh, interpretation of these assets, whatever the intervention is. Um, but I also put here dis benefits because I think sometimes we as uh, specialists in heritage, we forget that sometimes it's not all um, it's not all positive that we also need to look for any negative effects of of our interventions. So this is I'm just going to very briefly run through um, Shrewsbury flax mill maltings. So this is an, a really um, I'm starting in a positive way. Amazing site. Um, it was a, the first, it, it's a site of uh, which has a very long history, dating back to 1797. Um, it's located in Shropshire, uh, and you can see it on the map there on the left hand side, which is in the West Midlands uh, in England. Um, and it, it's, it started as a thriving uh, flax business um, and, with, and up until 1886, everything was fine. But then the mill closed as a result of a failing flax industry generally from the 1870s. So the building stood empty at that time for over a decade before it was then converted into a malting. Um, and at the time they did convert it, they also built other buildings. And this is in 1890s, we're talking. And, and this continued, this, uh, this business ensued up until the Second World War, um, where it was used as an infantry barracks, storage, um, as well as it was an apprentice house for children um, of poor families. They were accommodated in this space. And then in, 19, uh, in 1949, uh, it was taken over by a brewery, and they again started to invest in the site. New, um, they constructed two concrete grain silos in the 1950s and 1960s. And the maltings business ceased in 1987. The site closed and start, started to fall into disrepair. And at the time, Historic England, we were known as English Heritage, were involved with the site because there were lots of there was lots of interest from private parties in the site, but over time, this, the attempts to redevelop the site just always seemed to fail because of something to do with the complexity of the site, the costs associated with constructing and, and uh, reconstructing the site, and also what we call a high conservation deficit is that in many cases, developers found uh, other sites would be easier so because of the additional cost of rescuing the site, um, they weren't able to, to pursue with viable developments at the site. So in 2004, we had to come in um, as English Heritage at that time to do some urgent works to the site. And in, 19, in 2005, with support from uh, DCMS, Harry's colleagues, um, it was agreed that Historic England could buy the site, it was called Ditherington Mill at the time, as owners of last resort. And we had a grant from what was then the West Advantage West Midlands, a regional development agency in the area. And since two the, 2005, we have been on site and only uh, last year, but it ended up being this year, opened the site um, after many, many years of restoration and lots and lots of development on site um, with funding secured from both public and lottery sources, but there was also a lot of um, private uh, donations to the site. So this is where we start to move into kind of right. So we're going to try and evaluate um, this funding that we spent and bringing this site back into use. Um, and at this, the stage we're at now is we're just the very early stages of looking at just the construction element, because there's going to be many different phases, as you can imagine, of a, such a, an enormous site, um, including bringing volunteers into visitors, etc. So there are eight um, designated uh, buildings. The spinning mill is, is what we also know as the main mill. 
um, which is the one that is is now complete, but there are others and you can see all dating uh, built in, in different years, but of course, all very old. And the, the key thing for us when, we, when we're trying to think about this site um, as a stock, as a capital, is of course we have the culture and heritage capital, but there's also an, a big element of human capital, the knowledge and innovation and science that's gone into the development of this site and the existence of this site. There's physical capital. So as you saw, this site has been a, an anchor center for their local society for many, many centuries actually with lots of generations of families being supported through employment at the site income you saw that the apprenticeship also has provided accommodation and during world wars it has um, provided a space for for barracks so it's a really critical piece of infrastructure that has gone through um i'll say iterations of obsolescence and revival over time and that's really important because we've done some research and are really um, keen to share the idea that when you reuse sites as opposed to knocking them down and building again, there is lots of evidence that demonstrates that you save carbon and you reduce the need for new raw materials, virgin raw material, materials. So this site holds such value in terms of its embodied carbon and the carbon we avoid taking from nature as a result of reusing this site. This site has also been an important site for the local community um, and represents that local area. But more importantly, the, the main mill um, is what is known today as the grandfather of the modern day skyscraper. So it was designed originally by Charles Barge um, in the 1890s and was used uh, using a complete iron frame as opposed to only iron columns, which was what was done at that time. So it was a really new novel construction um, technique, which has then gone on to be successfully used and developed as a system, which today provides the modern day steel frame for skyscrapers. So this site not only has value in itself and its, its local value, but it also has national and international importance. It's been a critical part of the shaping of our urban environments today. And that's really important for context. So um, for us, we often underestimate the value of heritage because we don't understand the nuance and the importance of the history of these places. So that's for stock. Now, moving into flow of services that come, and we think they're both tangible and intangible flows of service that arise from this site. So, of course, it's an, a really important piece of infrastructure and the innovation um, and pioneering engineering behind it as a grandfather of all um skyscrapers is really important to understand and as part of bringing this site back into use we're really celebrating that about the site um, it also has its own very unique identity we have education services that flow from this it's very distinctive as you can see from the picture beauty is in the eye of the beholder but it's an important part it's part of our inheritance our um as I said, it's been through obsolescence and revival. And the question is, are we the generation that are going to see it disappear? And that's where, you know, of course, as, as the body that champions heritage, it became really important for us that this site isn't lost on our watch. Um, it also provides just the infrastructure to house people, to house jobs. It's a really important piece of community infrastructure. Um, it links back to memories. A lot of the people we are interviewing at the moment talk about their whole families, their grandparents working at this site, um, their parents working at the, the site, they themselves working at the site. So it has this real intergenerational um, flow of services that is emerging from here and, and a big community that um, work around and support it. So it's, it's, it is a really crucial place. And from these services that are unique to this asset or group of assets, 
this is where that value of heritage really emerges. And when we don't take into these things into account, we only count part of the value of this site. Often we talk about these sites as infrastructure and nothing else, none of the embodied carbon, none of the memories, none of the pioneering engineering that comes from it. And that's really our objective when we do our evaluations to tell these stories so that people understand the specialness and the uniqueness because special things matter to people and people fight for things that are special to them. Um, um, so from these special, these services that flow from this asset and collection of assets, um, they can emerge as benefits, but also, as I said, as disbenefits to people. And how do we know that when we're looking at evaluating? This is where monitoring becomes really, really important. Um, and we are still developing as it's quite, we, we, our evaluation function in Historic England is quite new. So we're still developing our tools and ways of, of looking at this. And really what we want to understand is, what has our investment, what is, what is the change that we've brought about? And so, of course, you start with collecting baseline data. So looking sort of, we've done quite a big exercise um, in some of our evaluations, looking at geospatial um, socioeconomic data, really unpacking statistics, uh, national statistics, to understand these places that we're working in. For example, Shrewsbury Flax Mill is in a place of um, high uh, deprivation, um, according to what we call the index of multiple deprivation, and it's a relative um, measure. Um, but we've also looked at what did employment look like in this area? What was crime? You know, lots of different socioeconomic data sets that are available to us to look at. Um, we also very, very important is whenever we work with anyone in any evaluation is we really need to start to monitor the quantitative data. So how do we capture these flows of services and the benefits that arise from them? Um, so it's really important to understand both the stock and the flows of services in when we're designing how we're going to monitor and capture benefits. Um, we use these these data in dashboards just to, to monitor and project management. We do a lot of surveys either with people who are delivering um, heritage-led um, interventions or who are benefiting from heritage-led interventions. In this case, we've done surveys with stakeholders at Shrewsbury Flax Mill. We've done uh, local, um, it, we've spoken to local residents. We've spoken to people who, are, who visit the site. So there's lots of different data sources there. Um, also looking at things like footfall. Um, we haven't done that for Shrewsbury, but that we do for other things um, and business diversity. So what types of employment spaces provided there really for, from our economic um, data perspective. And this is just, this isn't from Shrewsbury, but this is from um, a program that's called the High Street Heritage Action Zone. We invested in uh, six, 66 places, and you can see that on the map where they are. They're all high streets. And we've created sort of, we look at funding, uh, forecasting, spending targets, and what are our forecasted outputs from this. So all these things we based on our monitoring data, and then we create this dashboard. This is just a screenshot, but it's an interactive thing. So our, our managers, our partners can all kind of use this dashboard to see where they are, kind of looking at forecast versus actual, et cetera, et cetera. This is quite an old one. So this is how we kind of just manage our monitoring data and really try and understand what's happening. Then here, for example, you can go into a very specific um, intervention area, we call these heritage action zones, and they have a polygon, which is a spatial thing. And in this case, when we look at stocks, we've got lots of data, so we understand what, what is in this polygon, what types of heritage assets, what's listed, and what's designated heritage, what isn't. Um, and these are all um, something we call conservation areas, so they are of interest from a heritage perspective. Um, so these types of dashboards are really good at, for us to capture quarterly basis, what exactly is going on and what are you expecting to achieve? And here's just some how we would use those to present. So we say, 
we're looking at it either and and there are lots of different overlapping data sets we know we're looking at engagement which is about building social capital uh, we're looking at um, the economic which is the purple but black at the bottom you know what kind of uh, floor space employment space is being brought back into use looking at things like training volunteering just building a human capital and social capital looking at what heritage has been preserved here you can see that we've we've reinstated 130 13 shop fronts and 99 999 buildings have been repaired through this program so it's these types of things that really help us understand what is it that partners are achieving um and it's not only those quantified we're also looking at um lots of surveys and here we're really trying to understand from a beneficiary perspective how how do you feel you know in terms of pride and some of these really um qualitative aspects but we can also use survey data to quantify some of those things um and then our next stage will be thinking about valuing so within um our evaluations of course we want to say what is the value for money that's been achieved from this intervention um, and here we really look at it from lots of different perspectives and there will be um, each intervention each program we run will have different things it could be social it could be health related it could be related to building institutions people, human capital, physical, it could be the infrastructure, natural and body carbon is particularly important to us. Financial is valuing, uh, adding value to these assets. So in the case of uh, Shrewsbury, we're still work in progress. We've looked at crime, for example, and we've done um, some kind of using official statistics, looked at crime in the surrounding area as a ratio, in our kind of study area as a ratio to the wider um, Shrewsbury area and we've seen that actually since the site opened in 2022 we've seen crime gradually reducing and um, so now it's within our ratio it's 3.9 whereas when uh, we started it was uh, in the in the region of six a uh, peak in 2017 was 6.8 so reducing these things has a monetary value because calling police out to incidents costs. There's also a social cost to crime. So it's those kinds of things that we, we're considering whether we should put some values on those. Um, we've also looked at construction and construction is quite an orthodox way of, of estimating economic impact. So gross value added is something and we've seen that we've estimated it to be ooh, um, in the region of 32 million pounds. Um, we also have offices now in the Shrewsbury site, and they're expected to generate an annual net contribution of five to eight million to the local economy. Um, we also have done what we call a willingness to pay surveys, where we ask people how much they'd be willing to pay to have an interactive experience at Shrewsbury and we've come up with an average of 11, we're still testing that. But we also want to pick up on going forward with this evaluation, looking at more at the embodied carbon of Shrewsbury, you know, what would it have cost in materials and carbon to build this from scratch, to build it new rather than restore it, which is a thing that happens a lot here. Um, volunteering, um, educational experience there's there's lots to come so this is as I said work in progress but I think for us the main thing is is this is a good some goods and services have value but they're not easily measured so it's up to us to really try and think of different ways that we can really try and capture these values and and give them value on an economic platform thank you Thank you so much. Um, that's really fantastic, very insightful for us because we've been talking about it from a theoretical point of view. It's very, very helpful to, um, to hear this now in detail. I have a ton of questions, but the students have also prepared a few questions. Maybe you can just start with, with, with one or two things and then I hand it over to the students. Um, so first of all, um, I'm quite skeptical of question minutes, right? And I'm also thinking of would you study um, distinction, not distinction of taste. By the way, you mentioned the term cultural capital much earlier, right? The current studies. So it's really interesting. Um, and, you know, very often as a social aspiration. So I started doing such questionnaires when I, when I was a student. And 
you know, people said, oh, well, I like classical music and so on, but really they don't like, you know, I like, you know, special movies and, but really they like action movies and, you know, none of these things that they pretended to like. So how do you actually get the value from these kind of questions? Because they are artificial. So we, we, we were thinking about using social media data and analyze that because it is available and we don't have much um, kind of data sets and we don't have audience analysis here. But we really thought about looking at a place, looking at um, social, um, social media because it's kind of unrefined. You can really kind of see what, people, what music they like, what uh, you know, food they like and so on. Um, so have you thought about alternatives to the kind of questionnaires? And that's uh, it's the one thing to find out about the taste and the value systems. And, and the other thing is, um, I mean, how many people did you really reach? And so in this case, we don't really have a visitor scheme, right? Because it's used for offices and so on. Or, or is it also used for with an entrance fee that certainly parts of the mill can be viewed? And so I'd like to have a clearer idea about this. Can come back and I didn't unfortunately hear everything. Uh, it was quite muffled, but I think I got the gist of the first question. Um, so I think the, the question is a really good, good question actually, because one of the things we need to work out. So when we're doing uh, what we call um, stated preference, that means people are telling us their value. Uh, there's a lot of issues with that because people, you know, people will say different things at different times and you've got to effectively try to work with that. And there's a lot of things that we do within the surveys uh, that we're working on is trying to get rid of those biases within within those questionnaires. As I said in, in, in the presentation, one of the one of the issues is um, at the moment, it's a bit of a black box. Um, I know, Dala, you're doing some work on this as well, is trying to work out why they're valuing it. And that probably gets to some of those questions of, well, I'm doing it because I enjoy it. Um, I thought it was quite interesting. I think you brought up the film ideas. So this is a piece, this is um, a link uh, to a paper that was done by the BFI, probably, I think, 2007 or 8 or 10. Um, and this is actually where I spot my ideas off uh, in terms of actually. What are we trying to get to here? So I think it's really important to understand what you're trying to get to here. So what we've presented there is very much a way of trying to get to a value to using social cost benefit analysis. But by itself, it's it doesn't really tell you why they're doing it. So it doesn't mean then you can change policy uh, to effectively change different ways of. Uh, so we can pick up it in the surveys. Uh, we can pick it up uh, in. We want to pick up in the surveys as well. So that's how we're going to pick it up. Um, but that is very much from our stated preference approach. The other approach you can take, which, which we call um, reveal preference, so one of those is single hedonic pricing, where actually you look at house prices and different house prices to understand how people values. That works and doesn't work, and there's there's pros and cons of that. Um, the point we raised though on social media analysis, I think, is quite interesting because one of the things we are trying to work out if this if there is a big data approach to this. Um, and actually, could you use social media analysis to start looking at how value changes? I'm not entirely sure yet because I haven't really thought about it, about how then that turns itself into a monetized value for social cost benefit analysis. But you can, and people have done this already, you can use social uh, media analysis to really understand why people are valuing things potentially. And you can do you know, keyword searches. You can look at it through qualitative methods. Um, so that is something doing. What we're trying to figure out, though, is there any way within the bigger data sets that reveal value, which is much harder to do. Um, but I think in terms of looking at how why people value, yes, social media, you can use that. People have used that. I think there's a research out where people have done that already. And I think uh, so now you have to be careful with social media analysis because obviously, depending where you are, uh, people may not have access, so we have to deal with the digital divide. So it may be the case people don't have phones or aren't accessing certain platforms, so actually you're missing out a, a whole, pe whole group of people. So actually, we did a study uh, a while ago where actually what we did is we, this is for li libraries, where we boosted the survey to be very much face to face with people rather than doing the survey online as well. So there are other ways of doing it, but yeah, I think. Social media survey is, is the way to go. There are some people who also argue that there's a lot of noise within that as well. That's hard to take out. But I am very interested to see whether there is a potential there. Uh, so I'm going to, I'll leave it up to the, the very smart people uh, who work with this data to see whether we can do something. But obviously, a perfect scenario would be to have revealed values, not stated values, because stated values said there's a lots of biases within it. But 
it works and it does the trick and it's simple to do whereas revealed values where you're looking at other metrics to understand value is much harder to do um but definitely something we think we, we should push forward and actually one of our ohrc pieces of work actually is also trying to understand why these values from different methods differ so you ask them one type of method it actually gives you a higher or different number to other methods so i think i caught that but i don't know if adala you want to come in if you if you caught some of the question yeah i think there is so much exciting stuff that is available to us and i think it's how do we use it and how do we interrogate it of course there is no perfect data set out there everything has uh, bias and i think the main thing is to understand what the the negatives of any data set are so statistical data is good because you know it's been through it's been cleaned and we understand better what the biases are but um, I think moving to big data is, is really exciting but it's also got lots of issues that we need to take into account at the moment because uh, what we're doing is using mobile analytics data as a way of understanding how people travel to a site so that is in relation to visitor sites we also work with that and we've just recently completed a study what we call using what we call a travel cost method which looks at how far people travel is to base that value around how far people travel to visit that site and again with mobile um, analytics data you can start to do that even where sites either um, so the, the data we worked with for the studies we have done was given to us because people had given their emails during COVID and, you know, book tickets online. And so we could um, get some data from that. But where people don't do that, and a lot of sites are unmanned and not ticketed, but there is really good big data that's emerging. And just from an evaluation perspective, my preference is always to get what I call passive data monitoring data collection, i.e. people don't have to write it down, write it, add it to a spreadsheet or whatever. So that's what we're really trying to move towards. So things like understanding stock in our high streets um, action zone, we're talking about 68 places spread out in the UK. Thousands and thousands of heritage assets are involved in this. But what we're trying to do is use um, building information models to understand what is in those places rather than asking people. And then we just need to understand how much has been spent on each building. So the, there is a lot of interesting things. And as far as Shrewsbury goes, we are still in kind of the next phases. Um, we just completed the main works and obviously it's been a building site, so not much as far as visitation goes, but we do have what was called the Shrewsbury Friends Group uh, who've been supporting and there's been a lot of kind of developing that kind of footfall to the site because it's, it lies a little bit outside the town centre and encouraging the use of that site. So we're going into the next phase, which will be very much about visitors to the site. So it's going to be a multi-use site. There's still more development happening on different parts and buildings, but it's an exciting site and it's going to unlock things. And some of our early um, discussions are seeing that it's not only having a, an impact at the site, but also around the area um, and in the housing and property market in that area. Um, so yes, yes, more big data, please. Different ways of looking at it. And, and it's worth saying actually, Adala and her team are taking inspiration from um, a model created by X University called the Orval model, which looks at transport. I'm going to post it in the link because it's, I think, uh, uh, Adala, you'd agree, it's a fascinating model and something we'd like to have one day, but it's taken a, a massive investment from the environmental sector to produce it. But it kind of actually touches on some of the stuff that Adala was talking about in terms of the work that she's doing on travel cost. See this yes, we have received the link. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes, but please, would you like to ask some questions now? Because we are already over time, we have to be there with the time. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I would like to greet uh, the member of the panels, Mr. Sagar and Ms. Leeson, for sharing such wonderful, wonderful <laughs> insights on a model that only we can describe as revolutionary and, and almost frontier worthy when it comes to preservation of cultural heritage. Now, uh, we have discussed this framework in our course, which Professor Esther teaches us. 
and uh, it's an honor to meet the brains and the brawn behind this model. Now, there are a couple of questions which the students have brought up. Uh, so, I would start with the questions brought up by Devagya Agarwal. He is a student of banking and finance, and he's right over here. Devagya, this is behind your camera. So, his question is on compliances. Uh, first question goes, how does the framework integrate with other approaches to heritage management, such as the World Heritage Convention and other international frameworks, and how can organizations leverage these different approaches to achieve their heritage management objectives? That is the first question. The second question is, how can the framework be used to develop effective strategies for preserving and promoting heritage assets and what are some of the key challenges that organizations may face when implementing these strategies? Would you like to take this question up, Mr. Sabu? Um, I, I'll take the first one, and Dal, I might need your help on the second one. <laughs> um, so, um, on the first one, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really good question. So, uh, we'll obviously, we're aware of other, there are other, obviously management processes used in, in different organizations. Obviously, ours is, is actually just focused on a very, uh, the CHC is a very specific focus, uh, which is on, so, as I said, social cost benefit analysis. So, the interesting question is probably going to be probably two levels. So there are many cases where you are required to do uh, the work that we've talked about, which is actually valuing the costs and benefits uh, of your program and then putting it um, up to decision makers to make that choice. Uh, the question will be uh, like, where are other countries on that? Because there'll be some countries you don't use this approach. Actually, they probably don't use it for other sectors. It's a very UK uh, way of thinking this, the Green Book, uh, in terms of um, um, basically looking at every pound and pence. However, saying that, I think when we've talked to OECD and UNESCO, for example, they're very interested in this as an additional toolkit. Now, and that's what I mean, this is, this is not there to take over other toolkits, but as you're right, we do need to think about how we integrate that into those other 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 toolkits and sit alongside them. And obviously, Adala, you talked today about kind of thinking of that across the wider ways that sorry, England make decisions in heritage, which are are to cut. So you can come in on that. But I think that is a good question, and um, I think there's a question on the side here also, which links that. Which we're very much in the try to winning hearts and minds at the moment, um, and trying to get our approach across. But also, a really important point is trying to get people to understand that impact is not just GDP, it's a wider thing. And I know that's definitely something UNESCO and OECD and others are interested in. So um, we're hopefully going to work more with them, uh, but we're at the kind of, sort of the embryonic stage on that. But I'm going to hand over to Dala because you're much more involved in the day-to-day -day kind of management, heritage management side. Yeah. Um, I think, as, as we've said today, you know, this is a concept that is new and being developed. So, um, we we're kind of listening at that stage and we we don't have we have things on paper and we're still developing those as harry said there's there's a lot of research in progress or in the pipeline anyway and that's the thing is once we are up and running and have sort of a stronger grip on this concept you know i think we we align in so many different ways because our mission is is pretty simple is we want to um, encourage and champion heritage to ensure that it's there for the next generation, the one after that, and the one after that. And any new buildings actually today being created are probably the heritage of the future. So we want to learn from the past in order to always, so we're always thinking into the future. So for us, it's the, where all these conventions um, exist, we are working to the same goal. Now, we haven't put that into any official um, policy documents. It's really, at the moment, it's still research and development, but that is the goal, is to really, the, the thing we are looking at is the natural capital accounting approach, which is our best practice, and it's being used uh, quite heavily, not just in the UK, but internationally as well. So, once we, I, I would like to be uh, kind of more concrete but it's not it's still research and development but um, I have no doubt that we will be able to align these things in policy terms and that is a really big um, lesson so um, or next step so where we are now is in the research phase so people like Harry and myself 
but we are really then moving to being collaborative and speaking with sector partners because it's really important it reflects the richness of the knowledge that's already there in our sector whether it's within our, our national boundaries or external to them because we work very closely together within with many international organizations like UNESCO and um, we work a lot with ICROM we've been discussing this there so um we will get there but we're not there yet i can't give you the answer to that it, it is worth saying as as, as we, we 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 as in our department of community sports we do use a lot of this work already where we have it so every program project when we're asking for funding from our finance ministry has to have a cost benefit analysis attached to it um, which is also why then we realize we need to open up the doors to everybody to get them involved because we can't do it ourselves and there's loads of gaps that we had so we've been doing this for i've been doing this over 15 years now and we're now realizing we need to talk to the sector as dollar said bring everyone in and have a conjoint approach rather than us sitting in uh, behind a desk doing it for projects internally we need to open the door and show people what we've done so that heritage science slides i had i've had that for nearly 15 years uh, and now we're going to actually probably concept we're actually going to take the concept to reality and as dala said we're at the very we're at the early stage r and d aren't we dala we've got these ideas now we have to do the research to see if they work okay. and they may fail by the way some of these things we do may fail hence why it's r and d but that's fine we will go back we'll start again we'll rebuild um, and that's why we're going to do it it's worth knowing other sectors like the environment sector they've taken decades to get to where they've got to and even the natural capital approach has gaps in it still so it's not going to be done in one two years it's going to take some time it's going to need a concerted effort of everyone getting behind a way of doing something and working it going forward hopefully spinning off lots of research at universities as well to fill in the gaps and uh, we are already way over time but just a final question <laughs> what are the kind of research areas you would be particularly interested in as far as universities are concerned since we are a research institute at a university we would love to take this forward and um, perhaps you can just um, use some of these areas um, yeah, probably two things. I don't know if you So we, we've got two things which I just keep save time. One is um, the AHRC DCMS core has a load of research, research in areas already, which we developed. So that's looking at digital. There's very technical issues around how you value things. And then also uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we published our areas of research interest. So this isn't just cultural capital. This is across the whole creative social space and where we want um, evidence. So I'll just find that now and post it into the chat because that might really help understand what our wider evidence needs and interests are as well. And that might, you might say, I've already solved this problem uh, um, and I'll send you my paper. That's what we want to hear from people as well. We've solved it. We just don't know about it. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, so, um is there one pressing question uh, before we uh, conclude? Just one question. You can... one, one final question again. Thank you so much. It was wonderful having the two of you. Thank you. I would be slightly selfish and ask a question which I have in mind itself. So I'm a student of international affairs and while I was going through a document, I saw that uh, the, the framework is not assessing soft power at the current moment. Now, since it's calling for, for the research on soft power integration with the framework, what would be your recommendation, both Mr. Sagar and Ms. Leeson? What do you recommend for a researcher? How can I integrate soft power to this framework for a better, uh, you know, inclusive framework itself? Yeah, so I think I think there's a few things in the, in the original thing where we may have said we're, we're not looking at certain things, but soft power is in there. Uh, the, the, the big question I actually I would probably say to academics and challenges is like often we talk about soft power as a very kind of uh, high level concept. And what I always say to people is go back to the start, like what is the thing you're trying to change? So soft power for me is always an intermediary outcome to an impact. So if you're soft power um, and it could be your cultural or a specific intervention is leading to something. So in a lot of cases we talk about it leads to a trade deal or it leads to more trade. That's your final outcome. The issue though will be how you create the information to show that it was causal to, to to the soft power was causal to the outcome you're trying to achieve so in terms of measuring soft power i'd probably say think about what is it that you're defining as soft power but then actually what is the thing you're trying to change with soft power and i think that's probably the ultimate thing so i think a lot of the measures on soft power whether you have an international uh film festival they're kind of 
inputs or outputs they're not the final measure of soft power so i think that's going to be one of the challenges i often have with soft power is trying to work out what is the final end game of the theory of change what we want to change so if you're trying to change things hopefully if it's trade or if it's you know it's in some cases it's bring more tourists into the country as well they then start measuring that impact on soft power which hopefully you would bring into the into the into the framework I know that answers your question, but soft power has always been a bit of a scratching head for me to try to work out what are we ultimately trying to impact, I think. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. And uh, we hope you have a lovely day. Bye-bye from India. Thank you. Bye.